Welcome, my name is Leah Wing and I'm co-director of the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution and we are your hosts today. I'm going to do a screen share and walk you through just a little bit of what this uh, series is about. <clears throat> um, so today uh, we are gonna specifically be talking with the editors of the brand new Treaties on Online Dispute Resolution um, Ethan Katch, who's the director of the National Center and a co-author, <clears throat> as well as um, with Orna rabinovich Aimi of Digital Justice, Technology and the Internet of Disputes. And also on the panel today is Daniel Rainey, who's a fellow of the center and principal of Holistic so Solutions, and Mohammed Abdel Wahab, who's also a fellow at, the, at our center and assistant professor, faculty of law at Cairo University in Egypt and a founding partner of Zofakar and Partners. Um, so a very warm welcome to all of you. This is part of a broader set of, uh, of uh, webinars that we're doing um, over this fall. Um, you can see the cover of the book um, and the full order price. There's a link and if you want a 40% discount, there's also a link. We'll put these links in the chat later. We just wanted to give you a sense that by joining us today, you'll be able to um, access the book if you don't have it already. And as I mentioned, this is only one in the series. This is the launch of the book, the beginning of our celebration of the book. And then we have these upcoming webinars. Um, we will be sending out announcements to the same avenues that you heard about this one. And um, I will um, be giving you a link at the end for the next uh, panel discussion on ODR and AI. But as we get started with our panel today, um, I just wanted to give you a sense if you happen to be new to, uh, to ODR, either in the audience today or those who will be watching this on, on um, recording later, that the National Center is the birthplace for online dispute resolution. And we tip our hat to the director, Ethan Katch, who is really the one who was the visionary to come up with a concept that we will be soon disputing online as well as having the ability to handle disputes using technology when the internet went public. Um, over the course of the last 20 plus years, there's been a slow growth of interest in both ODR development, software development, platform development and usage with a lot of creativity and entrepreneurial engagement, particularly in the commercial realm but it's been spreading slowly. And as you can well imagine, many of you are part of this um, growth with the explosion of the use of technology by ADR and by courts with the pandemic, we've seen a, a major growth in both the discussion, the debate, the publications and the entrepreneurial fervor to um, harness the, the best use of technology. And of course that also comes with a number of risks that many of us are trying to think about. So today we're gonna to have an exciting opportunity to hear from the editors who envisioned the first ODR treaties that came out in 2012, and then also launched this book that we're gonna to discuss today. And they'll have a chance to talk a little bit about both the past, what's happened between these two books and where they see things going in the future. Um, there are 35 authors that took part in the book and um, we want to honor and celebrate them as well today. And each of them are having the opportunity to participate in the upcoming panels this autumn. So we look forward to seeing you all join us for the future panels. So without further ado, um, I do want to just say you should feel free to put questions in the chat um, and we'll pull upon them whenever we can. We'll certainly have a specific set of time set aside for questions and answers as well. So thank you for being here. And I guess I'm gonna turn it over now to um, Professor Dr. Mohammed and ask you, can you tell us what the inspiration was for the first edition? Well, thank you very much, Leah. It's a great pleasure to join you today alongside my esteemed colleagues, Professor Katch and Sereni, whom I had the pleasure of co-editing the first edition of the book. The idea when the first edition of the book was basically inspired by Ethan Catch's book, Online Dispute Resolution. Uh, when I started reading in the field, there were actually two books out there, Ethan's book and Colin Rule's book, uh, Online Dispute Resolution for Business. 
Um, and I had a great interest in the field at the time, but I thought perhaps a more inclusive and a more comparative approach where we can track the trajectory of ODR and perhaps shed light on the past, what has been at the time contemplated as the present in the 2010 onwards, and then the future of ODR. So I contacted uh, Ethan and Dan, and I said, I have this idea, and, and could you uh, be the co-editors? And I think they very much welcomed the idea, and we worked almost a couple of years to get the book together. It had about 24 chapters, uh, starting with what is ODR, the history, the present at the time, the future. And by the way, interesting thing, what we saw as the future then turned out to be the present now. And even now the future is more uh, uh, bright in a way. Uh, we also tackled different aspects of what we thought were interesting in terms of theory, system design, artificial intelligence, courts, uh, reputation, consumers, e-commerce, as well as, you know, in relation to mediation, negotiation, and arbitration. And we had the second part of the book, which deals with the continents. We took a continental perspective to ODR, Africa, Asia, uh, Australia, Europe, North America, Latin America, and Africa, in that sense. Um, so basically, we wanted that book at the time to serve as the leading treatise on online dispute resolution. So for students, universities, practitioners, that would be the go-to book uh, in relation to online dispute resolution. And the other aspect that we thought of was basically to ensure that the field gains the recognition and visibility that now it has deservedly gained. And that has indeed also helped us with establishing the UN expert group that had the uh, working group three to work on the ODR uh, guidelines in that sense. So pretty much since then, uh, or at the time, the book was intended to give uh, uh, you know, people an idea about what the past in terms of ODR is, uh, the present as we see it, and the future trajectory uh, of it. Uh, and then 10 years later, we thought it's timely to update the book. I don't know, Ethan and Dan, if you wish to add anything else, but that was really the, the gist and the rationale that we had in mind regarding the book. So, Mohammed, can I do a follow-up here? I, I'm curious, <clears throat> when you worked on the book and you envisioned the future, did the future arrive more quickly than you anticipated in some areas or more slowly than you anticipated? I must say and I'll be very candid, uh, it arrived, and that's an excellent question, Leah, I think faster probably. The reason is COVID has accelerated to a large extent the resort to technology. And I recall at the time when we wanted specifically in relation to arbitration, speaking to the leading uh, figures in the world of international arbitration at the time, for them technology was a luxury and that ODR perhaps maybe for consumers, online dealings, but not really for offline disputes. And everyone at the time contemplated that the way they would do arbitrations or the way dispute resolution was conducted um, across the globe will not change anytime soon. And then, you know, COVID pushed everyone out of their comfort zone and we were forced to adopt technology even for those societies, regions that were not prepared. And then everyone uh, began to acknowledge the need for technology and more so, everyone became an ODR expert in their own steed, or at least someone was, uh, uh, everyone was saying that. So I think that uh, it has accelerated definitely. Uh, uh, the future has been accelerated compared to what I thought could be the case at the time. Yeah, and I, I would say that the, the basic question that we're faced with in terms of, of putting out the information it changed. The basic question that we were competing with or, or uh, addressing at the time back in 2010, 2012, was, uh, is this possible? And most of our colleagues were basically saying, it's not possible, it doesn't work. And so that's not a question anymore. The question now is, how do we do it better? Uh, we're gonna do it, and COVID was the big bang. But even, even without COVID, we began making inroads in the notion that technology has something to offer as a communication channel for the kind of work that we do. And so the question shifted rather rapidly from, will it work to how do we make it work? And that's kind of where we are now. 
So Ethan, that brings me to you to ask, as you look back between 2012, when the book first edition came out and today, what, have, what has been the pattern of changes that you've seen? What, what's, um, where's the growth and where are things still stymied? How would you characterize where we're at now? Well, I think, I, I think Muhammad's point about tracing the trajectory of ODR is uh, an interesting frame to put all this in uh, because the trajectory of ODR, uh, ODR was, is, you know, COVID came along two years ago or a year and a half ago. Uh, first book was written in 2010 or 2011. So uh, we, we had a period of time and during that period of time, uh, several things changed, I, I think. One of the things that changed was that people stopped asking me about the possibility of resolving disputes face to face. I, I used to uh, get that question all the time. The assumption being mainly, mainly from the traditional ADR community, how can you resolve disputes if you're not face to face? Frankly, I don't get that question anymore. Uh, it's I stopped it stopped coming my way a few years ago, even before COVID. Uh, so for this book, the I think the the need was different. The expectation was uh, was a little different. Uh, we didn't have any trouble finding uh, authors. Uh, we didn't have to persuade anybody to to be an author. Uh, I I think even before COVID. ODR had become part of the dispute resolution landscape. Obviously, uh, COVID accelerated a lot, both in practice and about how we're thinking about things. But I think the other, the other big change was not the dispute resolution part of it, but rather the disputing part of it. Uh, because the last 10 years have seen a trajectory of increasing numbers of disputes. And ODRs, the need for ODR follows upon, I think, uh, the, the need found in the growing numbers and kinds and range of disputes that we have. I mean, if you take uh, the most obvious example currently, I think, at least in the United States, is this issue, uh, all the issues involving vaccines. Uh, I think a year or so ago, if uh, we had anticipated the people who were developing vaccines and the politicians who were promoting them uh, assumed everything would go smoothly. Obviously, it hasn't. Uh, and I think there's a lesson to that. With, with every new technology comes along a fair number of disputes, and these are disputes that we can't, we find it hard to anticipate. So. Uh, the need for ODR is not simply that the court, the doors of the courthouse closed, that's certainly part of it, uh, but the need outside the courthouse, inside the courthouse, on the street, uh, every time some kind of new facet of technology is discovered, it brings with it, with it disputes. My own interest lately has been in healthcare and healthcare has become a, a battleground over not only intellectual property disputes, but over the use of the use of data, the value of data, uh, because inherent in, in most of the developments involving healthcare is somebody perceiving that there's a way to provide value in data. And every little piece of data on the screen, off the screen, uh, is of potential value. So my general point is, uh, it's been the, the field exists. The nature of the field is certainly due to change and is changing, but a lot of that change is, is being generated uh, more by what's happening in the background, namely these disputing environments, uh, than in particular actions taken by 
uh, people in the field. Ethan, I have kind of a two part follow up about that. I, I was struck by your point about how there seemed to be a shift that occurred where people stopped asking, how could you handle disputes without <clears throat> being face to face? And one thought that came to my mind was, I wonder how much that coincided with the ability to do video conferencing where it's a different kind of face-to-face, -face, but there's still an ability to do face-to-face. -face. And connected to that um, is the fact that you early on, uh, quite a number of years ago um, in work that you had done, especially with you and Orna, had talked about the blurring of boundaries that technology um, as a disruptor has created in so many disciplines, not just our discipline. And with those blurring of boundaries, um, fields have taken a long time and professions have taken a long time to adjust to see how to, um, to, to respond to that. So I guess I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. It seems like that's in sync with your, your discussion about how top technology has been changing our society um, and how that's appearing here. Yeah, well, I think the, the point about being asked um, about non-face-to-face -face resolution. I think that predated COVID, um, but you're absolutely right that pre-COVID um, conference, online conferencing really was a negligible activity. Uh, I think if you look, Zoom has a history, a history seven or eight years. Obviously it, it's, his, it's, it's acceptance changed radically a year or two ago. Um, but I think the idea that ODR existed and was recognized in the dispute resolution field uh, goes back a, a little bit more than that. Not, not as far back as 2010 in the first edition, but uh, certainly when we were thinking about this edition and the thinking about the edition came before COVID. Um, the other part about boundaries is that's what technology does is change boundaries, change boundaries uh, about things that had been difficult in the past and, and now become possible in the present and future. Um, but the point I would make is that the shifting of those boundaries, however positive they, they can be, bring with it a fair number of negatives. And, and the demand for ODR can only accelerate. Is that an answer? Yes, definitely. <laughs> so Dan, to bring you into the conversation, I guess I would ask, how are these changes that Ethan's talked about and others that you wanna to bring to the fore, how are they reflected in the book in particular? And not just about the book, but in general, how do you see things have changed? Sure, let me uh, do a quick screen share as I have some of the uh, ubiquitous PowerPoint slides that we all uh, are more or less used to being driven by. I can get my computer to respond. Um, so, this edition of the book basically isn't, uh, when you look at the table of contents, it isn't broken into sections. But if you look at the topic areas that are included in the book, um, I think they, they group in basically four different areas or four different sets of questions. There's a, a set that talk about background context. There's a set to talk about the impact of technology on, on practice of various types. There's a section that talks about innovation and advancement of the field, technologically and otherwise. And finally, there's a, a section that, for lack of a better word, I would call geography, you know, what's happening in various places around the world. <clears throat> Pardon me. So under the background and context, in that section, what you find is, first of all, uh, Ethan's updated his history chapter from the first edition of the book. And we're looking back now at, um, you know, I guess back to the, to the mid 1990s. Uh, and so we're beginning to have quite a, 
quite a history of development use and discussion about online dispute resolution. And that's covered reasonably well. And I think gives a very good context for where we are now. There is a, a section on ethics or a chapter on ethics and standards. This has been a, a topic that has been more and more uh, at the forefront over the last two to three years with uh, International Mediation Institute, ICODER, the National Center, uh, the ABA in the US, uh, all looking at the idea of, okay, uh, we've established standards, we've established ethics for alternative dispute resolution practice, but we haven't really thought very well in most cases about how the uh, introduction of technology into those pursuits changes or affects the ethics and standards that we ought to use as we practice. So we discussed that. And finally, there's a, a dispute system design, which you know, when you begin thinking about the introduction of technology into any alternative dispute resolution process, what you're really doing is asking questions about design. And so the, uh, the notion of trying to find out what's the current thinking on dispute system design uh, is, is very topical. Under the practice section, the chapters that are there, um, the courts and justice feature large uh, because that is, I think, uh, arguably one of the places where there's the most activity in terms of uh, active work in online dispute resolution these days. One of the things that I think is, is different from, and I think a great improvement over the first edition and something that we'll talk about in one of the sessions later on is the idea of how you adapt disabilities into an online dispute resolution environment. Um, a very under-discussed issue that we finally have put to the fore in, in this particular uh, edition of the book. Uh, we readdress cultures to some degree in e-commerce, uh, ombudsmanship, and then there, there are pieces on all of the different aspects of practice, mediation, arbitration, peace building, negotiation. And the basic question there is, you know, so what? Now that we're using technology in these practices, what does that say about how we approach the practice and the people that we uh, go to and, and come to us as clients. Um, it's especially interesting to me in, in this whole area is the question of what does it mean to be human? How do you keep your humanity using the technology? And how do you deal with emotions? How do you deal with the things that, that we associate with face-to-face -face conflict resolution, but which become somewhat more difficult or at least changed when we're talking about the use of technology? And so uh, Noam has written a very good chapter on that. In innovation, um, we're talking about data security and cybersecurity, which are two different things. And these are, this section is the one that probably is the most changed, updated, or added since the first edition. Uh, we were talking about all this stuff back then, but the way we talk about it now is quite different because of the advance in technology and the ubiquitousness of some of the technology that we're seeing. So data security and cybersecurity, and then smart contracts, blockchain, and then all uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, it's impossible to write anything that is going to be absolutely accurate after the day you write it. But the best we can, we've got the best minds in the world in terms of online dispute resolution, addressing these issues that are, I think, at the core of the problems and the promise that we have going forward. And then finally, uh, geography, we have, uh, surveys of what's happening now in the US, Canada, Europe, Latin America, Africa, China, uh, basically asking people from those areas to say, look around and tell us what's current, what's happening, what's going on in the area where you are, and how does that fit in with these other topics that we've been talking about. So if you, uh, I'm making this sound like a plug for the book, which of course it is, but, but these are issues that, um, that we all should be talking about and we all are talking about and I honestly think that this book gives a framework and a basis for an intelligent conversation about many of these topics. So let me stop sharing there and go back. And um, uh, any follow-up, uh, Leah? I guess I would want to invite you to answer the question that Ethan and uh, Mohammed spoke to, which is you, you in, inferred that the greatest change you're seeing is in technological advancement around AI, blockchain, data analytics, and uh, privacy and security, for example. Um, are there other things that you're seeing that you see as you look back over the last decade where there's been significant change? 
yeah, we talk about smart contracts, AI, all of that. But if you think about it, all of the technology has become more accessible and easier to use. Back in the 1990s, when I was trying to integrate technology into the work that we were doing at the mediation board, uh, we could do video conferencing. But in order to do it, you had to go to a place that had a video conferencing center. And you, you, but it, was, it was very cumbersome and uh, it was resisted because it was cumbersome and because it was new technology people were unfamiliar with. Now, every grandparent in the world you know, talks to the grandkids across the country or across the world on Zoom and don't even think twice about it. So even, you know, we can talk about AI, we can talk about all of the other truly remarkable things that are coming along with digital uh, you know, analytics and machine learning, all of that. But even the baseline, even the basics of the work that we do with technology has changed for the better. And I can't help but think that, Ethan, that's one of the reasons why you stopped getting some of those questions a few years ago, because it simply became a part of our lives to use this stuff, and it became much easier. And so, yes, I believe that the, to me, the, the future, um, the, the red flag that goes up to me, uh, for me in the future, is around AI and around machine learning. And I think I'm not the only one who thinks that. But I don't think that's the only technological advance that has made a big difference in the way we think about ODR. So that's May I add something? Yes, uh, please. Just, I, I fully agree with Dan on this, and I think I couldn't have said it better. I would just one thing people may overlook between the first edition and the second edition. There is a chapter in the first edition that says uh, lessons for system design. Remember, this was at a time where we did not have sufficient systems in place, so the book helped people design systems. The new edition has the same chapter, but instead of lessons for system design, lessons learned from system design. So that is, I think, an important distinction and a build up uh, of uh, what has happened. And I think that would be one of the very interesting areas because systems, ODR systems will continue to change and perhaps radically with the advent of artificial intelligence. And I think one of the areas of focus, even though we had AI as one of the chapters in the first edition, uh, we were mainly talking about ICT, information communication technologies. And now we're way beyond that. We're talking about artificial intelligence, robotics, system analytics. And I think that will change the roadmap and really uh, uh, the trajectory of ODR. And if I could just stick a little code on the end of that, I think that makes the discussion about ethics and standards of practice even more important because it's going to, it should be driven by the notion that we are stepping into new territory with the new technology. So let's continue this discussion. Let me ask you all to weigh in here, building on this. Um, what are you most excited about? What do you think is coming around the bend? Um, what are you most excited about? Where do you see the most promise? And building on this, but, but drilling down a little further, what are you most worried about? Who's worried? <laughs> Ethan, take it away. Well, I, I'm definitely worried. I'll confess. <laughs> I'm, I'm worried about a lot of things, but uh, I, I'm, broadly speaking, I'm worried about the transformation, transition from new tools that are very attractive and that seem all positive and then uh, turn out to be problematic. Um, if I were to think of an example of that that everyone can relate to, I'd, I'd mention uh, social networks, uh, which were social when they began and fair enough to call them antisocial networks uh, these days. Uh, so that's one example. Uh, an uh, even bigger example are, are cell phones, mobile phones. Um, they obviously, you know, as you point out, Dan, people can uh, see their grandchildren at no cost, really, uh, over great distances. But on the other hand, uh, I, I don't want to. I can't really put my finger on where the ch problems are with that, but. Uh, I, I know that there are a myriad of issues that 
we'd ever had to face before uh, the, the iPhone came on board. May I add something to use Ethan's own words? I mean, he's the first one who came up with the, the term or coined the term fourth party. My greatest worry is that when Ethan referred to the fourth party, we had already known three parties and he added the fourth with the technology. And my greatest concern is that the four, we're back to three parties, but this time the third party neutral as the human would disappear and the fourth party would take over. That is a huge concern. And I think this is an area where R&D in the field of artificial intelligence is more likely than not moving in that direction to replace more or less the human element, at least to some extent. And I think the greater the application of that fourth party replacing the third party, I think the greater the concern for many of us. Yeah, I, I have a, uh, uh, a two-sided coin, a, uh, some optimism and some pessimism. The optimism is in that we seem to be in a situation where people are willing to consider I hate the term, but I don't know a better one, out, out of the box approaches to our profession, right? Uh, and so I think what that suggests is that as we move forward, there are gonna be a good number of very interesting, very innovative and very useful uh, adaptations using technology in conjunction with face-to-face -face work. Um, I, don't, I don't really see, um, all of one or the other. I mean, in fact, most of my practice over my career has been trying to mix technology into face-to-face -face work. And I think as we move out of COVID, that's gonna be pretty much the standard. I see that as a positive. The negative, and another positive that I see is that we are beginning to talk more and more about the dangers of AI and the dangers of some of the new technology, uh, which may lead to conversations about some standards and restrictions, et cetera. But I also see that as a, as a danger because um, I'm not sure that we will do it coherently. I'm not sure that we will do it uh, uh, in a consensus manner so that I'm, I'm not uh, sanguine about the notion that we're gonna have any sort of unified approach to how we control the technologies that we are creating that we're gonna turn loose in our profession. That's my biggest fear. I'd love to return back <clears throat> to this idea of boundaries being broken down by the disrupting force of technology. And in thinking about who regulates, um, there always will be government entities that will have an interest in that, particularly regarding the courts, but in other spheres of society as well. Um, and those government entities are sometimes cross jurisdictional, cross national boundaries, of course. But then there also are our professional organizations or our disciplines that are connected to dispute resolution that are used to putting out membership expectations or standards or requirements. <clears throat> but we have in, a, in effect an entirely different industry that we're now deeply linked to, which is the technology sector, <clears throat> which trains software developers, um, for example, in a whole different set of ways of thinking um, without dispute resolution or equality or access to justice, just as an example, as its core. And so what, are, what do you see as some of the challenges about the fact that, um, how do we make sure that the, that the software developer is not the gatekeeper for access to justice? If I could um, continue to bring up Vicki Rogers' um, excellent point, um, what do we do when our disciplines are breaking down and we're connecting across disciplines to harness technology, but at the same time, we're still in our silos about regulation. Any, any thoughts? That's one concern I have. I also see tremendous promise there, but it feels like we're gonna need to organize ourselves differently. So I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, maybe I'll I can. simply, sorry, yes, Bob. No. <clears throat> yeah, maybe I can add something, having spent 50 years developing technology and the last 28 years at Intel, developing computers and uh, working on international standards. Is, from what I can see in at least the access to justice and mediation is that 
the industry is fragmented by methodology <clears throat> and now uh, fragmented by technology. And so because there are no real agreed upon international standards, we will run into problems of access to justice, either because the physical infrastructure isn't there, the technology is fragmented. And once we start shifting boundaries around, things will not interface to each other and <clears throat> will have created more complexity instead of less complexity. And uh, I think that has the uh, kind of the worrisome effect of slowing down the progress we're making. Uh, and of course, you asked the previous question, what do we worry about night? The fact that we're in a growing business is a worry itself, okay? That disputes is uh, certainly on the rise, not uh, for, and maybe caused by a variety of technologies, but um, but I think fragmentation is a big issue in that we need to address international standards. It's not only developing the standards, but getting them adopted, because it doesn't make any sense to develop a standard if it's not going to be adopted. And so I think those are areas that are at least primary concern for me. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Mohammed, you, you were going to say something, Mohammed? No, 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 I think Bob. Sorry, no, no, no. I, I was listening to Bob. Thank you, Liam. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about standards. Well, I'm I'm happy to mention that um, there will be one of the webinars coming up in the fall that will directly speak to that as related to the chapter that Dan and I wrote. Um, this is certainly an area that I care deeply about and have been involved with for a while. The International Council for Online Dispute Resolution at icoder.org um, has issued some um, ODR standards that we hope are useful. A um, number of organizations and trainers have already started using them. Um, ABA, ICODER, and the center are collaborating over the last two years on the development of um, what we hope will be um, some useful best practices and perhaps enhancing um, standards as well. So that's, a, that's underway. And I guess I would just welcome people to get in, involved in um, ICODER. It's, a member, it's an ODR membership organization. We have people from all over the globe. Um, and this is, important, this is an important discussion. Also point you towards um, on ODR.info the center website, we have ethical principles for ODR, which are different than the standards. The standards are a set of rules to um, either self-certify and hold us accountable or hold each other accountable. And the ethical principles are ones that we hope are useful for guiding the development of ODR standards and also for systems development. Um, thanks, Ethan, for, um, for, for raising that. Um, I, I do want to say, I uh, really appreciate Bob jumping in. There's a wonderful comment by Mariz. And um, Sharon asks um, a, a couple questions here. Can I bring it to the table for the, pa the panelists, our, our editors, to speak to? So Sharon asks, is there a concern about leaving certain populations behind, especially by courts? Civil cases numbers across the US are trending down. How can we encourage reticent parties to engage to reinvigorate the services courts provide? Well, this, this is one that I'll, I'll say my two cents worth and then my colleagues can jump in. Um, do I worry about leaving people behind? Absolutely. Our court system minus technology in the traditional sense didn't serve everyone. It left many people behind. And there's no reason to think that when technology is added to the mix, it is all of a sudden going to bring everyone in and be completely inclusive. In fact, not only is there no reason to believe that, there's a reason to assume that it might make the, the situation worse, in my opinion. Um, and so I think that is absolutely an issue. And I, I think another thing that sort of go back to the, the technology issue is the, the field of mediation itself, and I realize there are not only mediators on here, but there are arbitrators and other other folks as well. But the field of mediation is, is in fact a fractured field. There are many approaches to mediation as a practice around the world. And the, the, the hubris in each one of them is they think theirs is right. 
And so we have many, many right ways to go about doing mediation. And we have many, many right ways to develop technology. And I don't really, and I think it's a fool's errand to try to, to homogenize either the practice or the development of technology. I think we have to look elsewhere and think about common approaches to principles or common approaches to fundamentals or, or, or some such approach that says, okay, I'm gonna leave your uniqueness alone but I'm gonna give you some guidance about how your uniqueness ought to fit in with the rest of everybody else's uniqueness. And I see that as a huge challenge going forward. That's helpful, Dan. Let me just jump on that and say that was the impetus behind the center's principles was exactly that in trying to speak to some shared overarching principles and help stimulate thinking about values as opposed to expecting that the standards will be the, the same in, in every, um, in every jurisdiction. Um, let, let's hear more. Um, Ethan and Mohammed, what do you what do you all think? Well, I, I think I the think risks. Ethan, go please. ahead, Mohammed. No, no, please, Ethan, please. Well, I think the, the courts are one area that I'm a, a little less pessimistic about than some of the others I mentioned. So I'm feeling good about about that. I don't I only feel less pessimistic about the courts because. Uh, we're, we're seeing some examples of uh, online courts and online small claims courts. And uh, the data that is being generated along with those processes is going to be public data, is public data. So I hope that some of the people who hear this, uh, who work, whose work is more empirical in nature, We'll have an opportunity to to say something and find out things uh, that we might have either didn't know about before or kept hidden before. So, uh, if one wants to struggle to find optimism, uh, that's one possibility. Mohammed. Uh, yes, I was going to say two things. One, uh, directly before, we're also fortunate to have with us uh, Mirez and Colin, and Colin can specifically speak to ICODA regarding the earlier comments um, made. Um, but on the issue of leaving people behind, I think it's um, you can see it from different ways. I mean, there is definitely the risk that Dan has highlighted, but there is also... Um, the upside of it, which is basically in many societies, at least in our part of the world, people may not have access to courts in remote locations and areas. So one would think that this could bring about denial of justice. They don't have means. And if technology, as is the case, could offer uh, online justice systems to them, then that could be uh, uh, an upside, a positive development. They have already been left behind sometimes. So giving them access to technology through satellite or otherwise, it may bring them an online justice system that was not at all available in whatever locations or distant localities they're in uh, for geographic reasons, for development reasons. So I think it's there, is, there are risks, but there are also prospects for use of technology in this respect. But, but certainly leaving people behind is one of the greatest concerns. I'm wondering as you read over the chapters that looked at regional development, but also the chapters that looked at technological development and your experience in the field, do you see any stark um, patterns about how ODR is being um, embraced differently in different regions and whether it's, uh, you're seeing patterns around it really extending access to justice or are we seeing some of the same patterns about regions and who is not being included? I'll give you one example to perhaps jumpstart the discussion. China, uh, well, the most populous country, the, the majority of the world population comes from China in a way, but uh, China, I think, is very advanced in terms of they have uh, the Beijing Internet Court where they are not only using artificial intelligence, but they're also using robots to prepare cases. And they have during the pandemic, just in a few months, resolved around 400,000 cases uh, online. Um, so that is, I think, a very interesting development where they have very advanced uh, even cities that are not anymore using cash or paper or whatever. So 
it's fully automated in a sense. So that's one end of the spectrum, in addition, of course, to the US in certain respects. But there are other places in Africa, for example, where people don't have internet connection. Uh, not that they don't have fiber optics, they don't have basic uh, dial-up connections, which are obsolete in my own country. I mean, no one uses dial-up anymore, but these people in certain parts of Africa, they don't have internet connection at all. And that's, I think, where the risk of leaving them behind is. So I think that the world now is, even though we talk about inclusion and we talk about everyone being on board and globalization, but still, the digital divide is a reality. And even though it's one of the millennium development goals to overcome that, it remains a reality. And I think it's in everybody's interest that states have made quantum leap in the use of technology to at least ensure that technology is available for other parts of the world. So at least to remain connected globally, because if this is not gonna happen, you risk excluding others and you risk alienating them and you risk not being able to communicate with them in time. Ethan and Dan, any comments? Sorry, I was on mute, so you couldn't hear my cat. <laughs> um, I'll be the, the pessimist to, to Ethan's optimist. Um, what, I, what I perceive in terms of access to justice around the world is that the rich get richer uh, and the poor fall further behind. Um, you have great technological systems for courts, which means that if you are someone who would normally use the courts or use the justice system, you now have an easier time doing that. You have an easier pathway in. If you're somebody who traditionally would not have trusted the courts or wouldn't have used the courts, you're now one more step removed because you're removed not just from the courts, but from technology. Um, and so I, I, I'm not as, as optimistic. I, I, one of the reasons I'm not as optimistic is, I don't know if you're familiar with the ProPublica study of the Compass uh, software that's in use in the federal courts in the US. It's a, it's a sentencing uh, guideline program, which uh, was uh, under ProPublica's uh, review, shown to be more discriminatory than judges who don't use any technology at all. Um, and so it goes back to, to what, um, uh, to what uh, Bob was saying about you, you know, creating the stuff and who's creating it. So I guess, you know, again, I'm going to be the pessimist to some degree uh, and just sh sh shout out a warning and say, you know, as we're developing all this stuff, we should really ask the questions about how it affects, you know, to use an old phrase, the least among us. So that leads me to want to invite you to share some advice about the future, building on what Dan just said. So I was thinking about um, my own question to you about what do we do when the boundaries are crashing down because we're employing technology and we're crossing disciplines, but the education and the standards are not necessarily um, being integrated. And so I was, uh, um, and I've, I've said this elsewhere, I believe that if we don't include access to justice and equity and equality as part of our call for proposals or requests um, for um, software developers or for ODR providers, um, then why will they be included in the systems if it's not included in the, in, in the, de in the development? So in effect, if we don't have code, we won't end up with justice if we don't have code that addresses it. And so building on that, I guess I would, I would say, what advice would you like to offer to those of us that care about the field becoming more equitable, more robust and more, more utilized? What's your advice for the next 10 years? Did you say when you foresee you. something about 10 years in technology, I'll leave you, Ethan, to discuss definitely, but it's a, a, a huge leap of faith. Technology is very <laughs> fast, but Ethan, I'm sure you'll uh, be able to enlighten. No, I, uh, I, I have trouble looking at the impact of technology five minutes from now, <laughs> no less than 10 years. Um, but more seriously, uh, I, I once wrote a book and, and uh, there was a review of the book and the author said, of the review said, 
that she found the book uh, quite optimistic. It took me by surprise. I thought I was uh, writing something that was carefully neutral. Uh, so I, I'm uh, not confident anymore in my own ability to, to make these predictions. Certainly, my God, 10 years out from now, is <laughs> uh, almost a fool's errand. I don't, I don't know if you can hear my dog barking in the background. He obviously objects to something. He's a good addition. Uh, um, but uh, what we can say is that uh, tech, use of technology is accelerating. Uh, and uh, on that level alone, I think we need to be, uh, need to be careful. I, I've had experiences in, uh, a few years ago, I was involved in a dispute that ended up being in a courthouse uh, next uh, near my near where I live, and uh, the courthouse was pretty old. And I asked somebody about it, and they told me that this was the courthouse in which Sacco and Vanzetti were tried. That was in the 1920s, so a hundred years ago. And uh, sitting around that courthouse was a depressing experience. So. Uh, I, I'm optimistic, at least, that some people can find access to justice uh, through technology. But will that shift, uh, make, create a shift in, in what groups in society have more or less access? access? Hard, hard to say. Well, I'll try to let some of your optimism rub off on me, Nathan. Uh, um, in response to Leah's question about what would you suggest, what would your advice be? I would say this to anybody who's in the field, make noise, uh, be active in organizations that talk about standards, that talk about fairness, uh, be, be agitators, uh, left to their own devices. Technology people will generally say, gee, I can do this, so I'm going to do it. And they don't ask whether they should do it. And they don't ask necessarily how the best way to do it is. And that's normal. That's, that's the way things get advanced. But if, if we don't have a voice as a profession, a loud voice saying, think about fairness, think about equity, think about access, think about all these issues that some of us think are very important, they're not going to get addressed in the way that they ought to be addressed. So that's my advice, make noise. Right. So there are more comments in the chat. If people want to take a moment to look at them, really appreciate um, Colin and Sharon and Marez weighing in. Um, any last questions from the audience? Um, just give you a moment to put something in there. And while, while we're waiting for that, I will just say maybe we could get some closing remarks from each of the panelists. So let's start with you, Mohammed. Sorry, you were cutting, Leah. You, you were saying something. I didn't hear you. Can I invite you to give some closing remarks? Sure. Um, I will simply say the following. Perhaps in three years' time, we will look at this and with a big smile and, and say, OK, what were these people thinking about these obsolete technologies and tools they were discussing? Uh, because we would have went above and beyond what our minds could contemplate about the future. That's one possibility. The other thing is that maybe for a longer period, we would crave technology because uh, it would have proved about the wrath of using it to a degree of destruction that people will you know, not have access to basic technology. That's another possibility, though very bleak one. I will simply say the following. Th this book and the second edition does invite uh, food for thought in a way rather than giving answers. It sets out the field, the issues at stake when it comes to using technology. We hope that we would have managed to put together not only a list of brilliant authors uh, or different chapters, but topics and issues that we believe are of great importance uh, to the field as it progresses and evolves. Um, and I think I quarter specifically has a role to play in setting standards and principles. It's not one of those institutions that, um, uh, uh, you know, offers dispute resolution services. 
And I firmly believe that regulators or PR entities that, you know, are believed to be regulating in a way should not be players of the game. So iCorder is one example where it has distanced itself from offering platforms of dispute resolution services and dedicated more to uh, advancing the field at large by setting proper standards, ethical guidelines, principles and practice uh, notes on different aspects. So I would encourage those who are not members, of course, to join and all the more contribute to its activities. Other than that, I will simply thank Ethan and Dan uh, for, uh, you know, co-editing the book and for all the great work they have done together, and especially Dan for the second edition. Uh, he has taken on the, the laborious and colossal task of taking the lead in doing that. So uh, hats off to him. And uh, I thank you very much, Leah, for uh, your capable moderation and for our participants for joining us today. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, Dan, I, I welcome you to, to give your closing comments, anything you'd like to say. Sure. I, uh, once again, I, I thank everybody for, for being with us. And um, this was, in some senses, a plug for the book, but it really, in my mind, was more a plug for the sessions that are coming up that we're going to do during Cyber Week. We're going to bring in the authors of all these chapters, and we're going to be talking about these particular issues, not in a general way, but in a fairly specific way, in a, in a meaningful way. So I would encourage everybody, if, you, or if your interest is piqued at all by what we've been talking about, I think you'll find those sessions are going to be very, very interesting. Um, and so, again, thank you, Leah, for hosting, and, uh, um, and I appreciate my colleagues very much. It's been an interesting journey to get this book out, and I'm glad that we, glad that we did it, but I'm glad it's done. Well, Leah, give me a, a word or two to finish off here. Uh, I also want to thank Dan for handling most of the details uh, of this book and for really, I don't know if you differ with me on this, Mohammed, but uh, I think Dan probably may have done close to as much by himself as, as the two of us did. Uh, I'm curious after this session to see it eight years out and see whether or not there's another edition of this book. Um, but I think ODR is certainly here to stay. And we live in a time when uh, it's possible, I think, to have some impact on, on what ODR becomes. Uh, I should mention that the National Center sponsors an ODR forum every year, at least we used to. Uh, sponsor such a forum. We haven't obviously in the last two years, um, but we're still on track. To, we are optimistic that uh, come next May, we'll have a meeting uh, in Dublin, Ireland. And uh, uh, contrary to the idea of putting everything online, we've always found it nice to meet face to face. So uh, I would say uh, we'll have this uh, conversation again, perhaps face to face, but certainly uh, in another couple of weeks, uh, more of it virtually. And I thank Leah for exhibiting her great skills at moderating. Thank you, Ethan. Um, absolute pleasure to be part of the panel and um, hear from these visionaries who have helped really shepherd the field, um, both in ideas, but also in um, presenting research. They're also the editors of the International Journal for Online Dispute Resolution that they launched in 2014 and that's still alive and well. So please consider taking a look at that, but also contributing an article about your research on these important topics. I do want to just say a couple things before we close. One is thank you, Merez, for weighing in with a question at this point that I think deserves much more conversation. So let's keep this on our radar. She asks, can you integrate, uh, sorry, um, uh, why do you think that no one is investing in the long run on making these changes happen? Um, and I think thinking about who's funding and what the funding sources are and also how we connect with systems that are doing um, uh, ODR development is very important in order to help uh, integrate further with technology. And SY asks us um, how we can be thinking more about making the integration of technology um, more reflective of our human interactions. 
that um, there is a chapter on the book that speaks some to that, and that will be included in a future webinar as well. But that's something that a lot of people are concerned about, and I'm really glad you brought that to the table, SY. So if I could just um, uh, ask you to bear with me for a moment, I'm going to share the slides about the upcoming webinars. It, it also include links. I've put them as well in the chat. Um, I want to reassure you that um, we will be sending out announcements. Um, the same way you heard about this, we'll be sending an out announcements regarding each of the, of the webinars um, to come. And the <clears throat> whole series is listed here. You'll notice we have uh, five in a row. This is going to be Cyber Week, and we'll be announcing more about Cyber Week on ODR.info. There'll be a whole um, slate of presentations, um, almost all unrelated to this book, that will be happening each day, the first week of November. And you can find that information at odr.info in the next couple of weeks. The very next presentation is gonna be um, by authors from this book that wrote on ODR and AI. And um, here's the Zoom link and the date and time and who will be presenting. We'll hear again from Ethan and from Orna, Kathleen Paisley, Chris Draper and Brandon Malone on topics that specifically Dan pointed out um, are where some of the greatest changes have occurred in the last 10 years. So with that, I wanna thank you all for your kind attention and for um, joining us today. Um, stay safe and we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar.